So as you can see, these people who are guests at the Oscars, they're like, oh, nothing is stopping me from getting my statue. Nothing's stopping me from getting my award. Not even a genocide. I'm telling you right now. Look. Look, that lady, she can be walking barefoot by the end of the night in them heels. Because having to walk to the Oscars? <laughs> wow. Okay. But that's what they deserve. There's a genocide going on, and y'all want to accept your award. So that's what was happening. The Oscars was on Sunday. You know, it's award season. The crescendo of the award season is typically the Oscars, as you all know. We're a bunch of rich workers. Yes, I still consider actors to be workers, but a bunch of rich workers pat each other on the back for a job well done. And, you know, decorum is very important. A lot of them are liberals, some conservative, but they all roll in the same circles. But something was happening outside. I want to give a shout out to people who were blocking the actors from getting to the Oscars. Yeah, that happened. Let's take a look. Because this was glorious. I just got to... I got to hand it to, to them. They were doing the damn thing. So let me share this. Oh, boy. Shout out to Stance Grounded for sharing this. Stance Grounded says, they had to ditch their cars and walk to the Oscars because the free Palestine protesters, they need a second walk of shame for those outfits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, what are you, who are you wearing? Uh, shame, that's what they're wearing. All right, let's, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> So, as you can see, these people who are guests at the Oscars, they're like, oh, nothing is stopping me from getting my statue, nothing stopping me from getting my award, not even a genocide. I'm telling you right now. Look. Look, that lady, she can be walking barefoot by the end of the night in them heels. Because having to walk to the Oscars? <laughs> wow. Okay. But that's what they deserve. There's a genocide going on, and y'all want to accept your award. So that's what was happening. Let me share what else was going on, because you, you love to see it, folks. All right, let me share this. So they came out in full force. 
They were celebrating Palestinian culture and dancing. It wasn't just all chance. This is what they were doing out there. So they were basically blocking traffic because they said, you're going to know what's going on and we're going to make you as uncomfortable as possible. That, that See, that's the goal of protest, right? The goal of protest is to make people as uncomfortable as possible so that they cannot turn their eyes away from what's actually going on, which is cool. I agree with. My thing, though, is... A lot of these people, they still got to the Oscars regardless, right? And so what needs to happen is they need to be reminded of what's going on and what some of them are still supporting anyway. And I'm going to tell you right now. When it comes to the Oscars and what these people support, it's really a, a class divide, right? It's a deep class divide that is shared that's not really shown on camera, but when you're on the outside, looking in, this is what they show. And whenever we try to post, whenever we try to appeal to, I guess, the humanity of some of these, I don't want to call them elites, but people who are placed above us, they also have a barrier with guards so that Nobody can really appeal to them. Let's see. Now, let me ask you something. All this for an award show? You know, you know things are messed up when actors get more protection than Palestinians. That's how you know things are messed up. When you're free to bomb little brown kids in a faraway land, but dare Something happens to that Givenchy dress. There, ha something happens to that Hugo Boss tuxedo. Oh, there would be hell to pay. Oh, do not let anyone smudge my Christian Syrianos or my Christian Louboutins. But little kids starving in Rafa, the West Bank, Gaza. <laughs> Look at my Oscar. But the good part was that there, even though what happened outside the Oscars happened. Inside the Oscars, some people were also reminding a lot of these Hollywood elites that there's a genocide happening. Let's take a look. 
and uh, they were mind reminded of it constantly. Tell me about the pin that you're wearing today. Yes, this pin is uh, for artists for ceasefire. We have so many artists here tonight wearing it. Uh, we're all calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. We're calling for the safety of everyone involved. Uh, and we really want lasting justice and peace for the Palestinian people. And so it's something that I think, even if a lot of that feels like a lot for people, we really want to say, like, let's just stop killing children. Uh, and there's so much there to process. And it feels like the easiest way to have a lot of the conversations people want to have is when there isn't, you know, an active bombing campaign happening. And so we just had the State of the Union, Joe Biden called for a ceasefire, says that it's what we need, said that we need a Palestinian state. So these are really important things that I think a lot of us are being vocal about, at least from a human level, you know, to try to appeal to people's hearts, yeah. Tell me. Now, while I do applaud him calling for a ceasefire, On the surface, it, it looks and sounds very nice, right? But that's weak sauce. I'm sorry, but it is. Let's break down what this gentleman said. Yusuf, I'm sorry, Rami Yusuf. He's wearing a pin that calls for a ceasefire. Let's Tell talk me about, about the it. pin that you're wearing today. Yes, this pin is uh, for artists for ceasefire. We have so many artists here tonight wearing it. Uh, we're all calling for it. Ava, du Ava DuVernay. Liberal. Right? Ava DuVernay, well, yes, call for a ceasefire. But Ava DuVernay, will she ever, will she ever call? For the ending of the apartheid, ending of the occupation of the Zionist state of Israel. So that the Palestinians can actually have, number one, a right of return, and they can actually have a single state, a one state solution, basically. Would she ever call for that? No, because then she will be considered anti Semitic, when in reality, it's not anti Semitic at all to call for the ending of the apartheid an ending of the occupation, illegal occupation of Israel. Would she do that? No. Mm -mm. She wouldn't dare. So that's Ava DuVernay. For an immediate and permanent ceasefire yeah. in Gaza. We're calling for the safety of everyone involved. Okay. Uh, and we Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali is a Muslim actor. Now, of course, he was one of the early artists that also was calling for a ceasefire, which I do applaud from him. However, like I said, calling for a ceasefire alone is not, it, it's the start, right? But it is not, it should not be the end goal. And a lot of people think, oh, we just want a ceasefire, and then that's it. No. That is the first step. Calling for a ceasefire is the first step. A ceasefire is really, it's like when you have someone that is, uh, in a hospital emergency situation, and you need to get them stable before you treat them. A ceasefire is just getting somebody stable so that you can treat the underlying issue. The problem is everybody just wants to keep, get, get a person stable and a foot out the door. All right, we got you stable. All right, kick them out. When in reality, it's no, get them stable treat the underlying issue and cure the illness. What is the illness? The illness is settler colonialism. That's the illness. They're just saying, oh, just stop, just stop the, the bombing, just stop the shooting. And then what? And then what? So, you can go harder. Right, Mahershala? 
we really want lasting justice and peace for the Palestinian people. And so if you want lasting justice for the peace and Palestinian people, that means you have to call not just for a ceasefire, but the ending of the apartheid and the ending of the illegal occupation. Come on. And now you have Mark Ruffalo. Great actor. But are you calling for more than just a ceasefire? Are you calling for the ending of the occupation? And the thing is, calling for a ceasefire isn't as risky as calling for the ending of the occupation and apartheid. Because if you call for the ending of the occupation and apartheid, then guess what? Hollywood will not be calling your name anymore. They won't be calling, they won't be sending you any more scripts. You won't be cast for any more roles. But is calling for the ending of the occupation and apartheid, is that the right thing to do? It is the right thing to do. Is it worth it? It's lives. Let's continue. It's something that I think, even if a lot of that feels like a lot for people who really want to say, like, let's just stop killing children. Uh, and there's so much there to process. And it feels like the easiest way to have a lot of the conversations people want to have is when there isn't, you know, an active bombing campaign happening. And so we just had the State of the Union. Joe Biden called for a ceasefire. He called for a temporary pause, a temporary six week ceasefire. It is not a permanent ceasefire. That means he called for a pause for them for stop killing people for six weeks and then, ah, let them keep going. Let it continue after six weeks. And then people are like, oh, we just want to get the hostages. And the thing is, they'll always be, think, think about this. They're always talking about the Israeli hostages, but they never talk about the Palestinian hostages. And there are way more Palestinian hostages than there are Israeli hostages. I always favor the lives of an Israeli over the lives of a Palestinian. Because they see their lives as worth more. Do I want the hostages to be released? Yes. The Palestinian hostages as well as the Israeli hostages. I don't want to see hostages at all. But in doing so, I also do not want to see apartheid and illegal occupation happening. I think that's what's important. Says that it's what we need, said that we need a Palestinian state. So these are really important things that I think a lot of us are being vocal about, at least from a human level, you know, to try to appeal to people's hearts, yeah. So that's why I say when people call for a ceasefire, it's like, are you calling for a temporary one or a permanent one? And then if you're calling for a permanent one, okay, that's a step in the right direction. But what about the illegal apartheid, the illegal occupation apartheid that's happening? What about the settlements in the West Bank that are happening right now that are illegal by international law? Are you calling for those to end? Are you calling for the Palestinians to have their land back? If you're not, then really are you for the justice for Palestinian people? And thing is, people are like, oh my God, the children, the children are dying. Yes. But why are we focused on just children? Why aren't we focused on their parents? Why aren't we focused on their moms and dads? Why aren't we focusing on their older siblings? Why aren't we focused on them? Because if you're a kid and you lost all your parents, well, at least you didn't die. But what about your parents? What about the mental of the kids that are still alive? What about the emotional effects that about the kids that are still alive? Yes. Fight for the ones that have died, but also fight for the ones that are still alive. Come on, damn it. 
how many kids did they break? There are broken children all over the West Bank right now, all over Gaza, all over Rafa. It's not just the ones who are passed. It's the ones that are still alive. The ones that have survivor's remorse. What about them? What about the ones that are starving right now? Let me share this with you guys. Because I was shocked at this. And a lot doesn't shock me these days, but I wanted to share this with you guys too. So you guys probably saw this. Maybe some of you did, maybe some of you didn't. But here's what CNN did. I was shocked at this. Hot, shout out the hotspot for this. CNN shared this and I was just like, what? Let's go. A warning to our viewers that what you are about to see is quite disturbing and it has to do with children. This is the human cost of the Israel-Gaza war. These are tiny figures of children on the walls of our studio, one for almost each of the 12,800 kids who have died in Gaza according to numbers from Gaza's health ministry. The death toll, quite frankly, is hard to keep up with. Airstrikes and now malnutrition and dehydration are killing them. Here's a glimpse inside Kamal Adwan Hospital in northern Gaza where several children have died of starvation. <clears throat> Just to let you guys know, only one Israeli child has died since October 7th. The rest of all that is Palestinian children. All right, let's continue. Tiny limbs, bones protruding. The constant sound of crying from children now facing starvation in Gaza. These were little Yazan's final moments. His tiny fingers gripped in his mother's hand. My apologies. Um, trigger warning for some of you if I continue this. My apologies, I forgot to let you know, but yes. Yazan Al-Kafarne was just 10 years old when he died on Monday. And a day later, UNICEF sounded this alarm. The babies of thousands of women who are due to give birth in the next month in the Gaza Strip are at risk of dying. Premature births are up. Mothers dehydrated and traumatized struggle to breastfeed. They can't find formula. They can't find clean water. And without relief, the threat from famine could eclipse that of airstrikes, like the one this past weekend in Rafah that killed five-month-olds, Wasim and Naim Abu Anza, twins, long awaited by their parents who finally conceived 11 years after they married, according to Reuters. Their mother, Rania, told the news agency, we were asleep, we were not shooting, and we were not fighting. What is their fault? What is their fault? What is her fault? In October, an Israeli strike killed 11-year-old Malak Sharaf, along with her 10-year-old brother Malik, and their six- and three-year-old sisters, Yasmin and Noor, according to the Washington Post. And 13 of their cousins also died. In October, Al Jazeera reported that an airstrike on a home uh, where Gaza bureau chief Wael al Dadu's family was sheltering after being displaced killed his wife, his 15-year-old son Mahmoud, his seven-year-old daughter, Sham, and his one-and-a-half-year-old grandson, Adam. The distraught journalist carrying Adam's tiny body through Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital shortly afterward. It is pretty tough video to... Journalists' families, journalists and many journalist families have been murdered in Gaza. Is it enough just for a ceasefire? Let's say the ceasefire does happen. Then what about what about the starving kids? What about the starving people? People are dying of starvation now.
the watch. And it's actually even worse than this because a statement from the family said that there were 12 members of the Al Dahdu family who were killed. Nine of them were children. In November, brother and sister Tarek and Reem, five and three years old, were asleep side by side when an airstrike killed them in southern Gaza. Their grandfather, Khalid Nabhan, told CNN he was wishing, hoping that they were only sleeping, but they weren't sleeping. They were gone. Al Jazeera reported that Salma Jaber was fleeing Gaza City with her family in December when they came under fire, and the four-year-old was shot in the neck and died. The middle child in the family, Salma's father, described her as mischievous and intelligent. And in January, six-year-old Hind Rajab was trapped in a car for days with the bodies of several family members, all killed, trying to escape northern Gaza. This harrowing audio of her cousin calling the Palestine Red Crescent for help captured the moment that their car came under attack from an Israeli tank. So... True warning. And to Jewel Sierra. Hello? Hello? Hin's body was found the following month, along with two ambulance workers who had gone missing trying to rescue her. There are too many victims to name, there's too many to fathom. And there are countless orphans, like Lana, whose story CNN's Jomana Karadshe told. Six-year-old Lana was under the rubble of her home for three days. Mommy and Daddy are underneath it, she says. I just want Mama. I want Baba. I want my family, Lana cries. According to figures from the Gaza Health Ministry, more than 72,000 Palestinians have been injured since the start of the war and a large proportion of them are children. Did you hear that? 72,000 injured. 72,000. Dr. Mohammed Sube is an emergency room physician who came from California to help in Gaza. My, my first several patients were pediatric patients. One shot in the arm while he was sleeping in the tent. Uh, another two kids pulled out of the rubble. We're still waiting to locate their family. Gunshot wound to the thigh in a three-month-old, um, crushed extremities. Of course, this conflict began after October 7th, as dozens of Israeli children were among those brutally murdered and kidnapped by Hamas. 42 children kidnapped that day, two still held captive, according to Reuters and the Times of Israel, after 40 were released in the temporary ceasefire. 116 were orphaned and 38 children were killed, including the youngest victim of the October 7th massacre, Mila Cohen, barely 10 months old, shot to death at Kibbutz Biri, her father and grandmother also murdered. And now here. Just to let you know, Israeli friendly fire also killed some Israeli people as well. This picture, five months later, another little girl named Mila breathing her last breath. Mila Abdul Nebi in Gaza. She died this past week of starvation. She was three. We'll be right back. So is it enough to say we just want a ceasefire? This is why I say it's more, there's more that needs to be done besides a ceasefire. I've shared this website before, and unfortunately this site has grown. So, says children killed in the Palestinian Israeli Palestinian conflict from 2000 till today. So you have 2000, 2001. Mind you, this didn't stop on October, this didn't start on October 7th. Oh, we're going back. 
24 years. 24 years ago. These little babies that were killed will be adults today. And yet they were they were killed. Look, 2000. 2001. 2002. And let's go on and on. Look. This is all before October 7th. All this. Look at 2009. The blue is Israeli children. The black, green, and red are Palestinian. Look at 2014. Look at this. 2023 to 2024. Take a look. Look at look at how much is going. Look 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 at how much. But that's not all. 2023 to 2024. Let's look more. More. 2023 to 2024. I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. I haven't stopped scrolling. I'm still going. I'm not even halfway, y'all. These are the lives of children, babies, infants, preteens, teenagers. These are the lives of kids alone. We're not even talking about their aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents. That is how many. Is just a ceasefire enough for this? Is this just only enough for a ceasefire? Is that it? When people say, oh, we just want a ceasefire. Surely you mean more than that, do you? I think that's important for us to not just call for a ceasefire, but to call for the ending of the occupation. I found this to be ironic because as I wished a peaceful and happy Ramadan for our Muslim siblings, this is quite ironic from the state of Israel. They said, ahead of the holy month of Ramadan, we wish Muslims in Israel and around the world a, a Ramadan Kareem. That's what they said. Of course, they're not talking about the Palestinians, especially the ones in Gaza. It's quite ironic that they're wishing that the best way to do it will be to stop the genocide. This is why they were screaming at the Oscars to cease fire and to stop the genocide. This is why they block traffic. That's what's important. Let me share this as well. because there was an actor that gave a speech. And I think this is important because they really, the Hollywood elite didn't have any choice but to hear about what's going on. 
to have it put in their face. This is from Jonathan Glazer, who won an Academy Award. Thank you to the Academy for this honor and to our partners, A24 Film for Access, the Polish Film Institute, to the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum for their trust and guidance, to my producers, actors, collaborators. All our choices were made to reflect and confront us in the present, not to say, look what they did then, rather look what we do now. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... <laughs> Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? Alexandra Bistron Kaladziejczyk, the girl who glows in the film as she did in life, chose to. I dedicate this to her memory and her resistance. Thank you. Hmm. I think it's important that we realize that there are a lot of Jewish people that are saying not in our names. That's important. It says that the 96th Academy Awards, the Zone of Interest director, Jonathan Glazer, uses the Oscar acceptance speech to speak out against what he called the hijacking of Jewishness in the Holocaust by Israel's occupation in conflict in Gaza. You know what I notice? Every single time somebody speaks out against the genocide that Israel is committing, they'll start, is, the Israelis who are defending Zion, the Zionists will say, oh my God, you are denying the Holocaust. It's like, no. In fact, we're not just, we're not denying the Holocaust. We're actually saying that it did happen. And how dare you commit the same atrocities that happened to your people? That's what people are saying. How dare you? How dare you know the history of your people have went through a Holocaust and yet now you're causing another one as we speak? That's what they're saying. Let's continue on. He said, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. It says his own of interest revolves around a Nazi commandant and his wife attempting to build their dream life in their home next to the Auschwitz concentration camp, portraying the dehumanization of detain detainees in the camp. Whether victims of the 7th of October of Israel or the ongoing attack in Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? There's something to be said here uh, from Jonathan Glazer when he said that dehumanization a lot of times what will happen is a lot of times people who are Palestinian will say, oh, the people who will speak about Palestinians, they'll start talking about how, uh, well, they do all these horrible things. They'll make them sound like they're, they're medieval in the way they treat others. When in reality, the medieval way that people are being treated is by the IDF. It's not the Palestinians. And then they'll do things like pink washing and say, oh my God, you're gay. How are they gonna treat you in Palestine? How are they treating me here? It's just, it's just wild. And this is why 
I'm happy that he made that speech because of what's going on. Like I said, more than just a ceasefire is needed, more than just a ceasefire is necessary. The ending of the occupation must happen. That's what needs to happen now. And of course, what happened in Israel, I'm sorry, what happened in um, in Gaza needs to be highlighted even more. And bringing more attention to it is just as important. I'm gonna share this as well because Remember when we talked about Aaron Bushnell? Well, this happened. Jericho, Palestine, named a street after Aaron Bushnell, the 25-year-old active duty member of the U.S. Air Force who self-immolated for a free Palestine two weeks ago today. The mayor of Jericho oversaw the unveiling. It's called Aaron Bushnell Street. They named the street after him for bringing attention to what's going on. Now, we don't have to do the drastic act of what somebody like Aaron Bushnell did, but at least we could start speaking the truth about what's going on. And it could be when we're speaking to our neighbors, our family, about what's going on. I think that's important too. But don't just talk about the ceasefire. Talk about why the firing started in the first place. And don't just start on October 7th. Go all the way back. Go all the way back to what Lord Balfour and his declaration where he pushed for. How these anti-Semites wanted the Jews out of Europe and put them on the doorstep of Palestine because they were real anti-Semites. They did not want Jews to be in Europe. That's the whole reason for the Jewish state because they didn't want Jewish people to live among them. That's ultimately what it was. If you're Israeli, you are a pawn of anti-Semites. You're a pawn, you're a tool to be used to rid Palestine of Palestinians so that the corporations can have their natural resources. It should make you feel sick to your stomach to be used in that way. Why you think that you mandatory, if you're of military age, you mandatorily have to serve in the military? Why do you think that is? It's not voluntary. I also want to share something too, because while we're talking about protests, and bringing attention to genocide. I also want to share this too, because it is related. I'm going to share this video really quick. Because a lot of people are not seeing this and it needs to be brought to attention too. So what we see here is also a free Congo protest. Yes, Israel is also related in the Congo protest. Just think about the diamond trade. 
So while we're also focused on making sure Palestine is free from the clutches of Zionism, let's also make sure Congo is free from the clutches of Zionism and Western imperialism as well. Because Israel is also influencing what's going on in Congo. The DRC. So I think that's important too, to know. I talked about how it's all connected weeks back. You guys can go ahead and watch that, that, that clip as well. But what's going on in Congo? What's going on in Sudan, Haiti? Palestine. I need to get on, uh, I need to do my research on Tigray, but I know there's a lot that's going on there too. But a lot of this is colonialism, settler colonialism, neocolonialism, imperialism that happens in these, these nations. Why? Because they want the resources. What's going on in Palestine is not because they just want a, a, a safe Jewish state. No. Look at what Netanyahu talked about, greater Israel. What is greater Israel? You're trying to grow beyond its borders? That's what it is. It's important that we talk about all of it because it's all connected. And don't just settle for a ceasefire. Ceasefire is the minimum, the minimum of what happens. Also, want to give a special shout out to Suleiman. I'm sorry, Suleiman, Suleiman Ahmed. They're coming after him too. Let's take a look. He says, Zionists are coming after my teaching license for exposing their lies. He says, I am a qualified math teacher in the UK, and although I am not currently teaching, achieving this qualification requires significant effort, and it serves as a reliable backup option. However, if anyone believes that this will deter me, they are mistaken. Nothing can prevent me from exposing their falsehoods. I fear no man. Expect more threats exposing Zionists soon. So let's take a look at this letter. It says teaching regulation agency, right? So it says, I am writing to you on behalf of the teaching regulation, regulation agency. The CRA acts on authority of the Secretary of State of Education and has responsibility for the regulation of the teaching profession. On February 28th of 2024, the TRA received a referral about you from a member of the public. However, having considered the referral, I am ready to tell you that the TRA will not be investigating this matter. The TRA has a duty to assess all referrals received, and anyone can make a referral using the TRA's referral process. The TRA only investigate referrals where the allegations are serious enough to potentially result in a prohibition order being imposed as set out in the teacher misconduct, the prohibition of teacher's guidance document. Having assessed the information submitted in a referral, it was de determined that the alleged conduct, if proven, would not meet the threshold to justify the imposition of a prohibition order. And as such, the matter will not be investigated by the CRA. The TRA disciplinary procedures and other guidance can be followed at, and he gives that, says, all referrals sent to the TRA, including those which are not subject to further investigation, are retained in the TRA's records rather than the teacher's personal record. This information is only accessible to the TRA. This is to ensure teaching standards can be regulated in with the TRA's lawful basis for for processing the referrals may be reconsidered so the future uh, allegations are received after 50 years, the information will be securely destroyed within the lines. So it says this letter is not to, intended to cause distress, but the TRA's procedures require you to be notified for this referral. So basically they tried to destroy his teaching license so that he can no longer teach. 
all because he talks about the truth about Zionism. It is no, it is not enough to talk about ending the fire. It's no, not enough to talk about a ceasefire. Also talk about ending the occupation as well as the apartheid. That's what's important. Now, what can you do? Yes, you can join protests. You can do things like that. But helping to educate people on what's really going on beyond that, beyond, you know, before what happened on October 7th, that's important. As well as boycotting. It is working. Divestments are working. Pushing your government to sanction Israel. That also helps because that's what also helped stop the apartheid in South Africa. So, if there are companies that you would like to boycott, those can be easily found. Of course, people talk about companies like Disney and McDonald's and Starbucks. Of course, I think Puma is already trying to change things because there have been so many boycotts that Puma's like, ho, 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 wait, 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 wait. okay, okay, okay. So that's important too, because the people are dying there. It's not just kids. We got to focus on everybody. So yes, they blocked the Oscars. And uh, well, that's important. I think uh, when it comes to that you got to make them uncomfortable make them so uncomfortable that it is more convenient to stop the genocide than it is to look away that's what's important thank you so very much for watching my channel and i deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart if you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.